So my first lecture was about local ectoposis and toposis of sheaves on a topological space. The second one about Grothendieck toposis. And uh, this specific lesson will be devoted to a topic to which I sh shall very little come back later, but a further generalization called the elementary toposis. And so, let me first give the definition, and then we shall make a comment. What do we mean by an elementary topos? Well, first, an elementary topos has finite limits. So, I shall write it that way. It has a terminal object. When you have two objects, you can take their product. And when you have two parallel mappings, <coughs> It's a category, yes, 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 yes. That's a category, of course. That's a category with the following properties. So when you have, you have the terminal object, the product of two objects, and you have the equalizers of two morphisms. If you have two morphisms, you can take their equalizer. You know that this implies all finite limits. Second, it is Cartesian closed. So meaning that uh, in this category, let me call it E, you always have an exponentiation. There exists an exponentiation which gives you the Cartesian closed adjunction. And three, you have a subobject classifier. I remind you, this means that you have a generic subobject like that, such that for every subobject here, wherever in the topos, you have a unique morphism phi, such that you have a pullback. <coughs> So the subobjects can be classified by characteristic mappings to omega. And we have seen that, this, that these properties hold in a Grothendieck topos. This definition is due to Lowveer in the early 70s. And in fact, in its definition, in its original definition, Lowveer was also asking for the existence of finite colimits. But it has been observed later that it is not necessary to ask this because you can prove from these axioms that finite colimits exist. For those who know quite a lot of category theory, one of the proofs, one of the more elegant proofs, is the following one. You take from E to E the functor which maps A on omega power A. Well, this is a contravariant functor. So let us make it covariant by taking the dual. So this becomes a covariant functor. This functor is monadic. And to prove that it is monadic, you, you use the monadicity theorem due to Hornbeck. And once you know that it is monadic, you know that all limits which turn out to exist here will also exist there. So if this one has finite limits, this one will have finite limits. So if the dual has finite limits, E has finite colimits. So this is just a very vague sketch of the proof for those who know the theory of monads, but the proof is very, very difficult. But nevertheless, uh, an elementary topos has finite colimits. So, why getting interested 
in such categories? Well, somehow, Lovir, together with Tierney, they were working together in those days, were interested in toposes from two very different points of view. Tierney was much more interested in the sheaf aspects, Lovir in the logical aspects. And when you look at these axioms, there is no set theory at all in these axioms. I take a category, I did not even say that the category is locally small, that you have set of morphisms. No, I did not mention it. You have objects, you have arrows, and, and that's it. There is a terminal object, binary products, equalizers, Cartesian closeness, a subobject classifier. These are very elementary things. I never, never, never use the word set. I do not need the word set in order to give this definition. So, long time ago, Greek geometers did develop geometry. They did develop the basis of arithmetic, the theory of prime numbers. Well, someday Fermat and Descartes introduced analytic geometry. Uh, then uh, later Leibniz, uh, uh, Newton and uh, various people uh, introduced uh, analysis. And then people introduced, uh, uh, well, uh, non-Euclidean geometries and so on and so forth. And in the 19th century, there was some type of crisis because one had met some paradoxes in mathematics. One had the impression that something was going wrong with mathematics, that they were possibly contradiction somewhere. And so one tried to settle down mathematics on something very safe. And at some point, set theory imposed itself as a base for mathematics. And when you see all the publications of the French school Bourbaki, well, they tried to build the whole of mathematics on set theory. The idea of Lovir was, no, let us forget about set theory. We don't need set theory to settle down mathematics. We shall settle down mathematics on category theory. It was his great idea of those days. And so I have to describe what a good category is to serve as a base for developing the whole of mathematics. Then he realized, of course, then Groton Dictoposis, as Laurent mentioned several times, were a marvelous context. But he did not like Groton Dictoposis because Groton Dictoposis are full of set theory. So, what is a Groton Dictopos? It is first an elementary topos. where you can perform arbitrary coproducts and third, you have a family, well, a separating family. As Laurent was calling them yesterday, separating, some people say, a family of generators, no matter, the separating family he mentioned. A growth and dictopos is exactly that. But if you do this, I has to be a set. You can, of course, try to perform the disjoint union of a class of sets, but it's no longer a set. So to, if you work in the topos of sets, the coproduct exists only if they are indexed by sets. When you have a separating family, also the set condition is very important. What does it mean, a separating family? Well, it means that if you have two U and V, you have in your separating family an object and a W which separates U and V. But of course you always have that. 
just take the identity on A. If U and V are distinct, composed with the identity of A, you see that they are distinct, so the identities are sufficient. Yes, but if you want to take this, you have to take all the objects of the category. So, the axiom here says that you can pick up just a set of objects and they will be sufficient. If you do not put the condition set, then this condition is just obvious because you take the identities. So, the definition of a growth and dictopos is very closely related to set theory. Here, you definitely have to say that you have a set and a set. And Lauvier did not want this. He wanted to base uh, the whole of mathematics on a category whose axioms were given without any reference to any set theory. I think that today, Nobody thinks that one day we shall base mathematics on category theory, but <laughs> this was the idea at the origin. And let me say that indeed you can do a lot of mathematics in the topos, and this has been done. Uh, you can develop analysis, you can develop differential geometry, you can do all those things in a topos, provided, provided that in the topos you have the axiom of infinity, like in the case of sets. In the case of sets, if you want to be able to construct, for example, already the natural numbers, you must have the axiom of infinity in, the, in your theory of sets. So it is possible to introduce the axioms of infinity in a topos. So you will say that the object A e is infinite when there exists an isomorphism of A plus 1 with A. That's what one calls an infinite object. If you add an element, you do not change the size of the object. So that means that the object is infinite. That's the definition in the topos. And so it contains an infinite object is the axiom of infinity in the topos. And when you have a topos with the axiom of infinity, you can develop in this topos almost everything in mathematics. So you can construct objects of the topos like this. Well, all the, these things that you use in mathematics, you can construct them in the topos. You can develop uh, the theory of continuous or differentiable functions. You can develop the theory of differentiable manifolds and all those things. This can be done inside the topos. This is a little bit why Lovier was hoping one day to base mathematics on an elementary topos. Eh? It contains... See, yes, there exists an isomorphism. Uh, it's infinite if there exists an isomorphism between A plus 1 and A. Okay. So this was for the definition. Now, notice that if you avoid the axiom of infinity, a category like the category of finite sets becomes a topos. The category of finite G sets, G a group, or finite M sets with M a monoid becomes uh, a topos as well. And these are not growth and dictoposes, yes? Uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry, the, you mentioned that uh, Tierney, Tierney was uh, working on topos theory from the point of view of sheaf. Of sheaf, yes. So Grothendieck toposes are e examples of this uh, Tierney's toposes. Uh, yes, yes. A Grothendieck topos, as I mentioned, is an elementary topos with arbitrary co-products and a separating family. 
Okay. So the Groton dick toposes are elementary toposes with two additional properties, arbitrary co-products and a separating family. So my question is, it is the ex specific kind of examples this TNA was working? Yes, it, it was, TNA was interested essentially on, on the case of Groton dick toposes, yeah. Are there uh, examples, natural examples of elementary toposis which are not Grothendieck toposis? In logic, yes. In logic. Okay. In but ordinary in mathematics, mathematics uh, no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, except, of course, finite sets or those things, but uh, mm, okay. <laughs> they are not the examples in which you are yeah. definitely interested. Now, uh, the point about elementary toposes, well, I think their interest is because when you focus on these axioms, and uh, okay, the, the way they are presented, According to me, it's the best way to understand really what the logic of a topos is. It will be the topic of my talks tomorrow. For example, look at this. The diagonal of the product. That's a subobject, so it is classified by something. That arrow, I call it the equality. Why do I call it the equality? Let us look in the case of sets. A pair AB goes on true if and only if it is in the diagonal, so if and only if A equals B. The image is true if and only if A equals B. So, I call it the equality. Now this is the equality. Since it is the equality, I get by, by Cartesian closedness a corresponding morphism from A to omega power A, which corresponds to this by Cartesian closedness. This one will be called the singleton. Why is it called the singleton? Well, because in set, you go to omega power A, omega power A, which is just a mapping from E to omega, it will send B on true, if and only if, A equals B. So the subobject classified is exactly the singleton A. Uh, another example. Take the identity by Cartesian closedness. This is the same thing as a morphism like that. It is called the membership relation. Again, because in the case of sets, if you take an element A of A... So omega, omega to A. Uh, to omega, yes. Thank you. To omega. Thank you. And omega to the A, as we have seen, these are the morphisms from A to S, so equivalently the subobjects of A. In the case of set, this goes on true if and only if A belongs to S, and so on. So many notions that you have uh, in set theory are represented by arrows in the case of the topos. 
And if you look at the case of a local ectopos, probably you imagine immediately what it is. Well, for example, this one, in the case of a local ectopos, omega is, well, the set of all elements. So what you do, A, S, you go on the biggest element at the biggest level where the restriction of A belongs to S. Like for the equality, you have two elements, you send the pair on the biggest level where these two elements become equal, and so on. So you have this set theoretical notions in a topos. Fine. They will be important, of course, to develop later the, the internal logic of the topos. Uh, yes, let me erase. Now, another very important theorem that Laurent has presented yesterday in the case of Groten Dictoposis. Take a morphism F from I to G. Every time you have something here, you can pull back and get what I shall call F star of A here. Just a pullback. So you have constructed that. There is a lot to be said about this functor. First of all, E over I, E over G are still elementary toposes. This is a very difficult result to prove in the context of elementary toposis, but it's a matter of fact. Uh, to get a good intuition of this, let us again have a look at the case of sets. So, what is a mapping like that? Well, that's the same thing as a family. For each point A, each point J, I take the inverse image, you know, I have J. I have A, which is here, and I take the projection. So I can view A as a disjoint union of all the fibers. And so, in this sense, A over J is the same thing. Well, it's not A. when I am working with set, set over J is the same thing as the power, as the J families of sets. And so, you have the J families of sets, so you take a J family of sets, uh, A, J. In J. And you construct a I family of sets. Well, this is simply the family A of Fi for I in I. So the functor which is there is just <coughs> constituted of the same family of sets but indexed in a different way. And so since the topos structure is defined component by component, there is no difficulty at all to see that, well, this is a topos, the structure is defined component by component. So that's the situation in the case of sets. And the very important result in an arbitrary topos 
is that you have two adjoint functors <coughs> like that. And these functors are essential to develop the internal logic, in fact, to, the, to introduce the quantifiers, existential and universal quantifiers. So, in the case of sets, what, is, what are these functors? Well, these functors, in the case of sets, Suppose that you have a family like that and you want to construct a family indexed by G. Given the element G, you can look at all the elements I such that F of I becomes G. These are the elements of i which can be related to this index. And so there are two possibilities. You take the join of the bi for f of i equals j, or you take the product of the bi for f of i equals j. Here are two possibilities of constructing something very natural. This one is the sigma f of the family bi. And this one is the pi f of that family of bi. In the case of sets, these are the two adjoint functors. But these adjoint functors exist in every elementary topos. Yes? Uh, suppose if J has... Yeah. Suppose uh, J has some structure, let's say like a post set, then uh, will these um, co-products and products will change as co-limits and limits? The left adjoint and the right adjoint? No, that's, uh, this is just a co-product and a product uh, Suppose if J has more structure. Yes, you can put, uh, suppose, uh, no, 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 there is, uh, that's just a, a plain co-product and a plain product. Whatever the structure J could be, uh, in the case of SAT, uh, this could be a vector space provided with a locally convex topology. I don't care. Now suppose the, J is I a take the product and the co-product. Suppose J is a partially ordered set. Yes, yeah, J is a partially ordered set. And yeah. then, J is a partially ordered set. Yeah. But then what? Uh, I was thinking whether uh, the similar thing ho ho also holds for pre-sheaves. So suppose you view um, J as some opposite category, and um, whether the similar adju uh, adjunction formula holds in case of No, but... Uh, I think your point of view is not correct. Okay. When you work in the category of sets, in the category of sets, I have an object which is a set of real numbers. It has an ordering, it, it has a lot of things. I have another object, for example, the rational numbers. It has a lot of structures. When you take the product of the two sets, this product of the two sets is their product as object of the category of sets. It doesn't use at all the fact that you have an ordering, that you have, uh, um, that maybe Cauchy sequences uh, converge and those things. When you view them as object of the category of sets, you view them only as sets. Okay. Now, you could, of course, try to work in another category than sets. For example, in the category of fields. Say, oh, these are in the category of fields. Oh, what can I do in the category of fields? Oh, yes, in the category of fields, things are much more difficult. And uh, a lot of operations which work on fields in the category of sets do not work at all in the category of fields. No, no. 
Okay. Uh, let me check the time. Yes. So. I was telling you that those things are closely related with the existential and universal quantifiers. Okay, you had this family B over I, and I have constructed something over G here. So let us take the image of that family that we have constructed. Let's just see what are the, the elements which I can get. Well, I shall do it in a very simple example. I shall take the projection. I shall take the projection. So I take a subobject S here, and I look at the sigma. P of S. What do I have? Let me look at its image. When is it the case that I shall have an element there? Oh. I shall have here all those elements B, which arise from something in the co-product. So, so that there exists an I, and there exists an element A in AI, such that AB is in S. So I find all the elements which arise from S, but uh, in my family, uh, well, probably to be clear, this is not clear what I say because I have changed my notation. So the S is a kind of family S indexed by all the pairs AB, a, B, eh? and the sigma of S give me, gives me the family of the sum of S, A, B, so indexed by B, for all the possible A, B. And the pi S is thus the product for all possible A, B, of all the S A B for all B in B. In one case, I take the co-product for all the elements which are mapped on B, so all the pairs A B. In the other case, I take the product. <coughs> so, in one case, I get the elements B. Let me write it. Clearly. So in that case, if I take the image, this gives me the set of those elements B such that there exist A with AB in S. Now, if I take pi S in order to have an element in the product, you, have, you need to have an element in each component. So this will be the set of all Bs, such that for all in this index A, AB is in S. If I want to have something there, I need to have an element of the product. And an element of the product is, well, each AB must be in S. So you see that uh, when I perform those two constructions in the case of sets, in one case, I end up with the existential quantifier, and in a, the other case, I end up with the universal quantifiers. 
So those two functors will be the key for defining the existential and the universal quantifier in a topos. So, but all these things are very difficult. I shall not say try to write down the proof, no, I shall say have a look in a book on this <laughs> to see how one can prove those things. Now, I shall not insist, but I mentioned that a Grothendieck topos is an elementary topos with two uh, set theoretical additional axioms, so that you imagine probably rapidly that all the other axioms that uh, uh, yesterday Laurent had mentioned but are automatically valid since they are not in the list. They must be consequences of my axioms for an elementary topos. So, for example, the axiom that if you have a co-limit, co-limits are universal. If you have a co-limit, you pull back the co-limit, this is still a co-limit. Whatever co-limit which exists, this finite ones exist, whatever co-limit which exists is preserved. Well, because we have seen that we have adjoints. Uh, you will see that the co-products are disjoint. If you take a co-product, then those two arrows are necessarily monomorphism, and if you compute the intersection of A and B as pseudo objects, you find zero. You will have all the properties like every arrow factors as an epimorphism followed by a monomorphism. You will have properties like mono plus epi is iso. You will have all the properties on the quotients that Laurent was mentioning yesterday. They effective equivalence relation. So if you have an equivalence relation, you take the corresponding quotient, while the, the elements which are identified are exactly those in the equivalence relation and so on. All those exactness properties that Laurent was describing yesterday are all valid in an elementary topos. And in general, it's not uh, very difficult to prove. Now, another point which will be very important to develop the internal logic. Yesterday, I mentioned at the end of my talk that uh, the subobjects of an object in a Grothendieck topos constitute a local. What about the subobjects of an object in an elementary topos? Mm. Well, if I take the subobjects of an object, <coughs> Of course, because we have finite limits, we can perform the intersection. Because we have finite co-limits, we can perform the union. The union, <coughs> <coughs> you just take the join of them and the corresponding factorization through the co-product, and you take the image. The image will be the union of the two objects, the smallest subobject which contains both of them. You have, of course, a biggest subobject 
which is A. Yes? In, uh, in that case, yes. This is a very... Sp yes, repeat the question. Okay. Um, is the union the same of taking the push out of the intersection? Yes. This is generally true in a category you need rather strong properties. It is, it is a true, for example, in an abelian category, but it's true as well in a topos. If you take this, you take the intersection, and you take the push out of those two, the push out, you get the union. Yes, in autopos it is true. Okay, there is a smallest subobject, which is the zero object of the topos, the initial object of the topos. So you have all those things. So if you already have a lattice of subobjects. You have a lattice of subobjects, but you have much more. We had seen that a local L that's a complete lattice plus distributivity. But that's of course the same thing we have seen. This is a complete lattice plus In a local, we could define the element U implies V in a local. This element U implies V was such that V is smaller than U implies V if and only if V meet U is smaller uh, W. I should not have two v's. W is smaller than u implies v if w meet u is smaller than v. So saying the distributivity is equivalent to say we have seen from the distributivity we have been able to construct this implication. But if we have this implication, that means that the meet operation has a right adjoint. And since it has a right adjoint, it commutes with uh, co-limit, so with suprema, and so you recapture the distributivity. So the distributivity in the case of a local is equivalent to existence of this implication. And what I want uh, to prove <coughs> is that this implication exists in the case of uh, an elementary topos. It exists and it is quite... Uh, easy to define. Let me give further definition. So I have the, my two objects, S and T. I can take the characteristic mapping of the intersection to omega. The intersection of S of T is a subobject of A, so it has corresponding morphism to omega. I can do the same thing just for S. It's a subobject of A. There is a morphism there. Take the equalizer of those two things. The equalizer is a subobject. I call it the subobject S implies T. What is the spirit behind this definition? What does that mean to take an equalizer? Think of that. We are taking those elements A such that A is in the intersection if and only if A is in S. The element A is mapped on true, 
precisely when it is mapped by this one on true. But this means precisely that as soon as you have A in S, it will be in T. So this is the same thing as saying that when A is in S, then it must be in T. One direction is obvious. The other direction tells me if I am in S, I am also in T. So A in S implies A in T. So this, this is a good reason for calling this subobject S implies T. And with this definition, you just verify that you have got uh, an implication with the adequate property. And so such a complete, such a lattice with an implication is referred to as an I think algebra. That's a lattice with top and bottom element and the implication. And the subobject of an object in uh, an elementary topos constitute always a writing algebra. And when this writing algebra turns out to be complete, well, that's a local. That's uh, one of the definitions of local. And so in growth and dectoposis, well, these lattices are complete. Let me end up this remark on uh, writing algebras. <laughs> no, I could do it. Eh? Yeah. I'm a bit confused with this the definition of this uh, a, a belongs to S intersection T. Uh, so you, you're trying to define uh, something shift uh, of... No. Yeah. When I write this, I put myself in the very basic example of the topos of sets. Yeah. So in the topos of sets, phi S intersection T of A is true if uh, A belongs to S intersection T, false if A doesn't belong to S intersection T. I remind you that in that case, omega is a two point set which I have chosen to write true, false, the two elements. Okay. So that's the characteristic mapping of a subobject. It maps the element A on true when the element is in the subobject, on false when it is not. So the equalizer is the set of those elements which are mapped on the same thing. So the element both are mapped on true or both are mapped on false. So in other words, that the element is in S intersection T, if and only if it is in S, in which case both of them are mapped on true. So when I look at the implication in Z direction, it tells me that when A is in S, then A is in T. This is the reason why that subobject which is the subobject of those elements A which satisfy this property, the subobject should be written as implies T. Now, uh, okay, time is running, so I shall just mention to you that if you have on omega times omega, you can very easily define morphisms which are intersection, join, and so on. Eh? And uh, and that the structure that we have got here 
is precisely induced by those morphisms. That means if I have S and T, two subobjects of A, well, I can always have to omega power omega the pair phi S phi T. I have phi S from A to omega, phi T from A to omega, uh, and then here I can compose with one of those morphisms, and then I get the characteristic mapping of S intersection T, S joint T or S implies T. These operations on the subobject can be uh, given at once by operation directly on the object omega, and you just get things by composition. For example, well, this one will be the characteristic mapping of the diagonal, and so on. Well, I, want, I would like to conclude with the last point about uh, elementary toposes. So, every Grotendieck topos is an elementary topos. In particular, a topos of three sheaves is a Grotendieck topos. This is an elementary topos. But, when we work with the topos of three sheaves, we are interested in the corresponding possible Grotendieck topologies to get the subtoposes of sheaves. So, can we do that in an elementary topos? Well, the answer is yes. So, take the three sheaves on C, a small category. We have seen what the object omega is. Omega at some object C is the set of the sieves uh, on C, or subobject, if you want, uh, of C. This was the object omega. What is a topology T? Well, a topology T consists for every object C in giving some sieves that you declare covering. You choose just among the the subobject of the representables, some of them that you declare covering, and in such a way that uh, the maxims are satisfied. So, T is a subobject of omega. But if T is a subobject of omega in the topos of three sheaves, well, there is a corresponding mapping classifying the subobject. So a Grotendieck topology can be classified by a morphism from omega to omega. And T is a Grotendieck topology if and only if the following three axioms are satisfied. Uh, if you apply the morphism J to the canonical through the true subobject, you still get the true subobject. This corresponds to the fact that a representable functor is covered by itself. Second, if you take J and apply J twice, 
you recapture G. Think of G as a kind of closure operation. If you close twice, well, this doesn't help. After one time, it's already closed. And the last one is Uh, let me see if I write it correctly. Like this. G commutes with the intersection. If I take G, of the intersection of two things, that the same thing as taking J of both things and then performing the intersection. So those three axioms are equivalent to the fact that the corresponding subobject is a Grothendieck topology. Now, once you have a subobject here, it has a characteristic mapping to omega. So you can further compose with G. <coughs> so from A to omega, you have J phi, which classifies some subobject which you call the closure of S. You get a bigger subobject, which you call the closure of S. So there is a closure operation associated with uh, my topology J. And you will say that an object A in my topos E so, let me see. E. Elementary topos. G. A topology. That is a mapping which satisfies those three axioms. is a J-sheaf when every time you take a monomorphism like that, which I shall call dense, that is, the closure of S is A itself. Something is closed when it is equal to its closure. It is dense when its closure is everything. So every time I have that, no, not A. B, because A is already used there. And every time I have a, a mapping here, there exists a unique factorization. So a sheaf is something which is orthogonal to all the dense subobjects. And then you have this category of sheaves, which is a subcategory of the topos. It is still a topos. And there is a left adjoint, which is left exact. So exactly the situation which you had in the case of Grothendieck topos carries over to the case of an elementary topos. You define the topology in that way you define the sheaf as being orthogonal to all the dense subobject, like we did, orthogonal to all the covering cribble. Here you take all the dense subobject. You get a corresponding category of sheaves, which is still a topos with an associated sheaf functor, which is left exact. And if you ask me the question, what is the omega object of this topos of sheaves? Well, you take G, and you take its image, 
and the image will be uh, the omega object of the topos of sheaves. So that's it. We shall stop, as I say to my students, six minutes and a half, because when I say five minutes, this is quite indeterminate. So <laughs> let us try to stop six minutes and a half. <laughs>